Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 6th of October, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So Danny Ryan posted the, or I guess like shared the official Altair mainnet announcement blog post here, posted on the uh, Ethereum Foundation blog. Now, for those who may remember, Altair is the upcoming ETH2 kind of beacon chain network upgrade that's happening on October 27th. All the clients, all five of them have releases out now that have, um, the you know, uh, that are the correct version that are compatible with this network, uh, with this network upgrade. So if you're running any of these clients in your staking, uh, set up definitely go upgrade i updated mine today uh and you know it was very smooth just have to kind of restart the client automatically get that kind of downloaded there all the release links are in this blog uh, blog post there's also a bug bounty going on as well and a little bit of an FAQ here. But yeah, don't forget to update because I think I mentioned this yesterday, if you don't update and you're stuck on the old kind of versions, it's gonna be the same result as if you were stuck on the old versions uh, within kind of like when we do forks on ETH1, you're just gonna be left on the old chain. But it's actually worse with uh, uh, kind of like with with uh, uh, ETH2, with staking, because you start losing rewards if you do that. With, I guess with proof of work in mining, if you're mining the wrong chain, then it's just the opportunity cost. You kind of like waste a bit of money um, on electricity and, and, and stuff like that. but uh, with with staking, you see like the real upfront cost straight away if you if you don't upgrade. Now, of course, it's not going to be a major cost um, or anything like that, but. You definitely want to upgrade, uh, not a major cost like over a short period of time, but you definitely want to upgrade uh, just to be safe on the safe side and for the health of the network too. And the funny thing is, is this is, as I've mentioned before, this is the first network upgrade for, for ETH2. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how many people uh, will, will, is, are actually going to upgrade and be ready on October 27th because uh, it's been what? I think the last time, uh, sorry, when it launched was December 1st when the beacon chain launched. So since then, people haven't really had to pay attention to their validators if they were just running running on their kind of like hardware at home, then they didn't have to pay attention to anything. It was all well and good. But now that they have to pay attention, we're going to see like what percentage of the network is kind of very passive where people are just running their clients without without worrying about anything. Um, and and I think there's going to be maybe a small percentage of people like that. So, th so if you kind of like see if you're on one of these uh, big and chain block explorers and you see that uh, some of the nodes drop offline or whatever, some of the validators drop offline, that would be totally normal. But I expect them to come back up really quickly because as I said, because uh, you are staking ETH and if you're not on the correct chain, you're you are, you know, you're poised to lose ETH uh, through kind of an inactivity leak. You definitely don't want to be on the wrong chain in that scenario. So yeah, if you're staking at home, definitely go upgrade. If you're staking with a service provider, they, I mean, if they're, unless they're a really bad staking service provider, they should have already upgraded already or, or already in the kind of process of doing so. Um, but uh, you know, you may you may, may just want to make sure with them. I'm sure that at this point or closer to the I guess launch on October 27th, they'll probably send out an update, an email or something, kind of um, kind of going through how uh, they're going to basically update and everything's all well and good on that front there. But anyway, another topic on staking today was an unfortunate announcement from Rocket Pool that. Uh, they have delayed their launch essentially uh, because yesterday or I guess two days ago the bug bounty team or bug bounty program helped discover an exploit that also affected other staking providers uh, and as a result they are postponing the launch to implement the fix now this is this was a critical exploit as far as I know and it wasn't it didn't just exist within the kind of rocket pool implementation it also existed in uh, in Lido finance as well um, and the, the the cool thing is I guess, Maybe maybe cool is the wrong word, but the nice thing to see was that this um this exploit was actually all this bug was discovered by Dimitri, who is uh what well, I think the co-founder I think it says here uh yeah co-founder of Stakewise, which is actually a competitor to both Lido and Rocket Pool. So you know this person saw that and was like, okay, well we got to notify these teams, right? Um and they go on in this thread to say that at at Stakewise we believe that even when dealing with our competitors, the more secure we are collectively, the stronger the entire ETH2 staking ecosystem becomes. To achieve this, we must communicate and watch each other's backs. I love this ethos. This is just the Ethereum way right now. I'm not taking advantage of this even though they're competitors and everything like that and making sure that uh, everything runs smoothly here. Now, I think with Lido, the, the vulnerability would have only affected less than 100 ETH, as they said, the impact if it was exploited. So it wasn't that huge for, for Lido itself. I'm not sure kind of like what it would have resulted in for Rocket Pool as Rocket Pool isn't live on mainnet just yet, but I'm really happy to see that this was caught before they went live. Um, but the, the thing is, is that people kind of like, I saw some people talking about this. They're like, oh my God, like Rocket Pool's taking forever to get to, to mainnet and um, there's a critical bug like two days before they were going to launch or like one day before they were going to launch. Uh, you know, this is amateur hour. 
that's not the right uh, frame of thinking here. Like, I'm pretty sure Rocket Pool, from memory, had three audits before uh, kind of like setting their mainnet date. They had the whole system audited, and this kind of still uh, slipped through the cracks at the end of the day. So, and it was exist, and it existed in Lido as well, a, a service that has been live for quite a while now on mainnet. So from that perspective, I don't know. I didn't get why I was even seeing people do that. I understand that people may be speculating on the token and maybe this isn't good for their kind of like uh, speculation because a lot of people would have bought the token and led up to mainnet to kind of play that hype trade. But I mean, I'm sorry, but like if you're doing that, then you take on the risk of something like this happening and the project isn't going to cater to you and be like, oh, sorry about that. We kind of like, uh, you know, we, we kind of ruined your trade, um, you know, not purposely, but like, I don't know. I just, I, whenever I see those comments, I'm just like, this is super weird. But anyway, um, uh, really, I'm just really happy that they caught this before it all went live because obviously once it's on mainnet, it's a lot worse if it gets, uh, if it gets exploited and things like that. So I'm looking forward to seeing when they, you know, what, what launch date they give. I'm not sure when they're going to go live. Maybe they're going to want to have to do another pass of the code and, and kind of make sure that everything is, is all well and good again before they announce another mainnet date. But yeah, a bit, bit sad to see, but good that it was caught before they went to mainnet. Otherwise, we would have been in a world of hurt, that's for sure. All right, so Optimism has announced their first retroactive public goods funding experiment. Now, for those who don't know, just to give a bit of context here, a while ago, Optimism announced that uh, all of the profits that they were going that they were generating from their uh, optimistic Ethereum sequencer, so the thing that processes transactions or, or validate or whatever on, um, on their layer two network, all the profits, so that's after costs of kind of like gas fees and infrastructure and um, probably kind of like um, uh, uh, p personnel costs as well, but pure profit would be donated to public goods on Ethereum uh, and kind of like uh, some, some, something similar to what Gitcoin does. And in this blog post that they detail kind of like the process of that they're going through with, for this experiment. Now, this is the first experiment and they do say that they're going to be learning from this and then taking those learnings and doing you know, more experiments as time goes on uh, using those learnings. Now, there's $1 million up for grabs here and you can nominate a project that you think is deserving of a portion of this, of this money. Um, and if you want to follow along with uh, allocation discussions, it's happening on Discord, and there's links here to both of that. Of course, there's a link in the YouTube description. But I mean, this is like quintessential Ethereum right here. I think there's only, I mean, at this point, there's only like a handful of projects that are kind of, I guess, like quintessential Ethereum. Like they are following Ethereum's mission to a T. Like they do, like in my eyes, they do like everything they can to uphold Ethereum's values, ethos, and mission. Like, and I'm talking like all of them, like the, you know, the values and ethos of, of tr being truly decentralized, um, you know, building sustainable ecosystems, funding public goods. There's very few projects out there that actually um, hit hit an all, an, on all marks. And I think, you know, obviously what comes to mind is something like Gitcoin, of course, um, uh, optimism. I know there's a few other projects out there as well. Uh, you know, all the core core devs working on the clients and things like that. These people are definitely mission driven rather than kind of like profit driven at the end of the day. And you can see this from, you know, what Optimism is doing here. Uh, and they've been working on this for ages. I mean, it's not just kind of like an overnight thing for a lot of these teams. They've been working on this for many, many years. I mean, Gitcoin has been around for a long time. Optimism has been around for a long time. And they, you know, they existed as Plasma Group before Optimism. And of course, like the core devs have been around for quite a while as well. So from that perspective, I love supporting this sort of stuff, like a million dollars to public goods. And it's not just, they're not just saying, oh, we're going to give a million dollars to Gitcoin and be done with it. They actually want the community to get more involved and to nominate projects that they actually, that they want the funds to go to. So if you, if you click here, there's a Google form that pops up and uh, you'll be able to kind of like nominate uh, uh, people until I think November 5th as part of the experiment. And there's also going to be a bunch of people, I guess they call them badge holders, which are eight optimists and 16 Ethereum community members, which will quadratically vote on the allocation of this $1 million uh, operating off of this badge holder manual, which you can check out the link to here as well. So really, really excited to see this. I was actually wondering what happened with this the other day. I was like, okay, I remember Optimism announcing this, but I wonder when they're going to put an update out. And I was pleasantly surprised. This is the first thing I saw when I woke up today, when I checked Twitter, I saw it. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. A million dollars. Because if, I mean, if you'd been paying attention to CryptoFees.info recently, you'll have seen that the Optimism Network uh, has been generating a lot of fees. For, like every day, it's anywhere from like, I think 80,000 to 150 plus thousand dollars uh, of, of kind of like fee revenue. As I said, that's not pure profit because they have to pay gas fees with some of it. Uh, uh, sorry, Ethereum layer one fees with some of it, and they have to uh, cover other costs that they have as well. But 
I'm pretty sure they have millions of dollars at this point in their kind of, I guess, like treasury to go towards public goods. And this is just the, the, the first experiment. So very much looking forward to seeing more experiments play out here and very much looking forward to other layer two operators following this model because it's, obviously it's not just optimism. We have a lot of different L2s out there, a lot of different projects that can be doing this. And it's funny because... Over the past couple of years with Gitcoin, especially with grants, we've seen different kind of like sponsors go through. And each round, uh, you know, you might have like your regular sponsors, but then you have like new sponsors and, and sponsors from people that I wouldn't even think would sponsor this sort of thing uh, from even outside the Ethereum ecosystem, which is just really, really awesome to see. I remember... I don't know if it was last round. I don't think it was last round. I think it was around before Kraken sponsored Gitcoin, which was huge, right? The like Kraken being a, a, a kind of like centralized exchange there. Um, but there's like plenty of examples of other projects that have done this. And I think it's just setting a really great uh, kind of like, I guess, theme for the, for the Ethereum ecosystem that, hey, you know, we're all about embracing public goods funding. We should make sure that the people building the tools that we all know and love and use are getting funded appropriately for it so that, we can create sustainable open source software. And, you know, a Awoki, Awoki from Gitcoin talks about this a lot, where a lot of open source software traditionally hasn't been sustainable because there's been no business model for it. And getting donations to uh, to kind of people to maintain this open source software has notoriously been very difficult because uh, just, I mean, generally do getting donations for anything is quite difficult. But what we're doing with crypto is we're basically turning that on its head and saying, well, we have this really cool thing called crypto economics. Let's use that to fund public goods. At the end of the day and 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 the thing is is that a lot of open source software bec uh, is, is really good it just stops being maintained after a while because the developers like well you know if, i mean for a few different reasons but like, one of them would be well the developers like well i'm not getting paid for any of this there's millions of people using this stuff and i'm not getting anything out of it and and you know maintaining this is stressful because there's so many projects that rely on it so i'm just going to kind of like uh, leave it as it is and and that's it and people expect you to maintain it and fix it and fix issues with it for free like no one puts up the money for it they're just like, you know, I'm using this and you need to fix it for free. So I think with this kind of stuff within the Ethereum ecosystem, we can basically fund sustainable open source software and make sure that we don't have instances of uh, of, the, of these kind of projects, uh, or of, I guess like the, the, the people building these projects burning out because that, that's not what not we want for this ecosystem, of course. All right, another great tweet from Polynyar today. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if I can go back on every refill from the, like the last couple weeks, two to three weeks, and see if I've mentioned Polynyar on every single one of them. I think I have at this point. But they said in this tweet today, and I quote, for the first 12 years in the monolithic blockchain era, we had the blockchain trilemma. With ZKPs or zero knowledge proofs and data sharding, we have economies of scale that invert the, the trilemma. The more decentralized you are, the more scale there is, the cheaper the transactions get. It's a whole new paradigm. Now, for those of you who don't know what the blockchain trilemma is it's basically something that i believe vitalik came up with quite a while ago where he said modern blockchains, and this was years and years ago but modern blockchains could only do two of three things so it's basically the trilemma is like a triangle and on each point of the triangle um oh, sorry on each edge of the triangle you have scalability um decentralization and security you can only have two of three if you have decentralization and security you can't have scalability if you have scalability and decentral uh in decentralization uh you can't have security if you have scalability and security you can't have the you know you don't have decentralization not that you can't have it's just you don't have because that's just the way the trilemma works um but in a kind of like sharded paradigm where we scale uh horizontally via sharding and and by doing so we give kind of like the vertical scaling which is layer two more juice as well we kind of invert that on its head and, and and you're allowed to have all three of them because with ethereum and with the roll-up centric roadmap we have a decentralized and secure base layer and then we have a scalable layer at, at kind of like uh at, at layer one with sharding but also at layer two with uh with, with zkps as 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 polino says here so the fact that we, we can do this now like this wasn't See, I, I think maybe providing a bit more context here will get you to understand like how how much of a breakthrough this is and why this is why Polly and I are saying this is a new paradigm. Up until I think the last six to twelve months, um, probably a little maybe a little bit longer than that, depending on kind of like what you were reading and stuff like that. It was not at all clear 
how blockchains were going to scale long term. It was still a very open question. It was like, okay, are we going to scale everything on layer one or are we going to do it with a, a kind of like layer two centric approach? Like, okay, well, we have sharding, but do we do data sharding uh, only or do we do execution sharding as well? Oh, but that breaks composability really badly. And it just like, it, it was just a mess of ideas, right? But then over the last six to 12 months, it's coming to view that, okay, this is the best way to do it. We do it in a modular design as, as Polyno has been talking about a lot lately where you have a data availability layer or you have a data availability and security layer and then you build on top of that with zero knowledge tech and, and ZK proofs and zero knowledge rollups and all that good stuff there and other layer two constructions that live on top. And that way uh, you get like the best of all worlds, but also uh, you introduce sharding into the mix and you can basically become, I guess, more decentralized over time with Ethereum sharding. Because for those of you who don't know, the more validators there are in the Ethereum network on uh, in the um, kind of like Ethereum 2.0 network or, or, or the kind of like the beacon uh, on the beacon chain, the more shards you can have, which means the more scalability you get. So we've literally, we've quite literally inverted this trilemma and basically made it so that, you know, uh, as I said, like you, the more decentralized you get the more scale you get out of it and by definition the cheaper the transactions get as well which really i mean this is a massive breakthrough and this is why i keep telling uh, you guys and i keep going on about it the next five years of crypto is going to be so so different from the last five years we're going to see much much less focus on different layer ones and we're going to see a lot of focus on layer twos and a lot of focus on this modular design where layer one starts specializing and say, okay, well, I'm only a data availability layer for layer two, or I'm a data availability and security layer. I just don't think we're going to see any more of these monolithic L1s launch. It's not going to be worth it, um, both kind of financially. It's not going to be worth it socially. You're not going to get any attention. You're going to be losing out market share to these layer twos. And I think the last few months has been the last hurrah of these layer ones in terms of get, of these kind of like layer ones that just fork the EVM and get adoption like that. I think that they're always going to be some of them that do it and add token incentives and kind of get get some liquidity there. But really, uh, I expect to see the next five years being totally different. And as Polina says, being a new paradigm uh, that we haven't seen before. And this stuff just gets me so excited. Like I haven't been, I mean, I've been going on about this on the refuel a lot lately, but I haven't been this excited about Ethereum ever, like literally ever. And that's a big thing for me to say because uh, I've been in Ethereum since early 2017. I have been through most of kind of like what Ethereum's had to deal with, uh, except obviously the early years, but you know, I've, I've kind of like followed along with all these discussions. I've followed along all the scaling stuff and, and layer twos versus layer ones. I've had to deal with all the Ethereum killers over the years. I mean, not just me, but like a lot of us in the Ethereum community. And I can safely say that I'm the only one who feels like this. A lot of people that I talk to that have been around for a while feel exactly the same as me. They feel like we're finally at the point where we, we can actually see a clear path forward for Ethereum dominating the world. We always believed Ethereum would, but the path kind of like forked off into a bunch of different, um, <laughs> a bunch of different kind of like, uh, uh, areas where it, we had like um, people working on each different area, but then over time the four came together and we've kind of just come back to one path now where the entire Ethereum ecosystem is aligned on this path and we know exactly what we need to do to get to the end goal, which is a fully scalable and while well, uh, fully scalable and uh, decentralized and secure uh, kind of system that uh, onboards the world. That is the goal. That has always been the goal. And we can get there now with this with kind of um, system that we're building here, which is why I'm so excited. Uh, nothing else has excited me as much as this has in all my years in the Ethereum ecosystem. So uh, yeah, and I mean, as I said, I've been bringing up Polynia a lot, but I think they are the clearest thinker when it comes to this. I I just I can't believe like how well they explain all these concepts in such a way that like I'm not you know obviously I'm I kind of like more into the weeds than 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 maybe other people are, but a lot of people that I know that have read uh, Polynia's work are like, wow, this is you know this actually clicks for me now, and that's why I'm kind of disseminating it out to you guys because I really want you to kind of. I guess, realize the, the fact that this is just like a game changer here. This isn't me being, you know, excited because, uh, because I'm excited about everything. This is me being excited to the point where I'm literally telling you this is a new paradigm. I know that's kind of a cursed term, um, given that it's used whenever the price is going up, but this is regardless of price. This is pure tech. And in a pure tech world, when you have a new paradigm like this, things get crazy and wild really, really quickly. It's exponential from here. So, you know, really do start paying attention. I mean, I, a lot of you are. I mean, you're listening to the refuel, watching the refuel, you're paying attention. But 
you're going to see a lot more of this stuff shake out and I just can't wait for it. But anyway, I'm going to stop uh, stop there because I went on about this yesterday. And I mean, I've been going on about this a lot. And I know you guys enjoy it. I know you enjoy my enthusiasm, but I don't want to bore you going on about it all the time. So moving on to a tweet that from uh, from Seb at Zappa today. He said, some of Zappa's uh, recent hires include uh, five people that were previously Shopify engineers, one Lightspeed engineer, one Facebook engineer, and one times Google chief of staff. And then he goes on to say, the great Web2 talent migration has started. Web3 welcomes you with open arms. What are you waiting for? Now, this was the topic of today's Daily Great newsletter. But essentially what I kind of like spoke about in the newsletter was that this great migration, right? Where if you're working in the Web2 world, what are you working for? Like if you're working for Facebook, what is the mission of Facebook? What is the ethos? What is the culture? What is your end goal there? Like, are you actually making the world a better place or are you or are you making it a worse place? And I actually would argue that at this point, Facebook is making the world a worse place. I don't actually think Facebook brings any benefits to the world. Um, you know, people say, oh, I can't, it lets me help, but it lets me come up with my family, it lets me communicate and things like that. I'm sorry, but we have like so many apps for that now. You don't have to use Facebook for that. You can use uh, Telegram. You can use WhatsApp. I mean, I know Facebook owns WhatsApp and it's it's a bit, bit different there, but you don't have to have a Facebook account to do this. Um, but, uh, you know, I know people like to share photos and stuff like that. And unfortunately, <laughs> Facebook owns Instagram as well. But I guess getting back to the topic there, like if you're working at Facebook, especially if you're an engineer, I don't know. Like if, if it was me, I, I especially if I, if I, the younger engineers that, may not be as entrenched in the company yet, they might be thinking like, well, this can't be it, right? Like, I want to do something. I want to change the world. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And you won't get that really from Web2 anymore. There are there are some Web2 companies that you will because uh, they are like startups and you can go work there and everything. But I'm talking about the mega corporates, uh, like even Google, like, and, and, and you know, all these other ones, like even Tesla to an extent these days is, is too big. And I've heard like a lot of people just don't like working at Tesla for whatever reason. So, you know, would you work for these centralized, monolithic corporate um, kind of like zombie companies that make a lot of money, but like they're basically not innovating. They're not doing anything cool or new. Or would you rather come to Web3, which I use Web3 as the term that kind of encompasses all of crypto, which basically has more innovation than any other technology industry by far. Like you won't even you won't even get close to that. But also has innovation not just across technology, but across uh, the financial system, across human coordination with DAOs, across culture, and kind of like empowering creators with NFTs. There is just so much more opportunity for you to make a difference within crypto, and it's actually the main reason why I'm so involved with Ethereum is that. I had, I looked at like all, all the other industries for quite a while and I looked at it and I'm like, and, I, and not just within tech or, or whatever, but like just generally, I was like, where can I place myself to make the most impact in the world? Where can I actually uh, make a change and, and get, and, and kind of like add a lot of value to people? And crypto was a no brainer. Like it really, well, I mean, Ethereum uh, specifically was a no brainer for me and I'm not an engineer, right? Like I'm not uh, a developer or anything like that. I am, I mean, I don't even know what I am at this point. I mean, I did marketing at set for a little while, but I would just consider myself like an Ethereum guy. Like I just a bit of an all round I do a bit of a bunch of stuff. I don't code though, but I don't, you know, I don't have time to, to learn how to, unfortunately. But I think just the fact that if you want to kind of like be involved with a movement that's way bigger than yourself, that is decentralized, that is a bottoms up grassroots thing that doesn't have like this monolo monolithic entities at the top, doesn't have all this corporate crap uh, involved with it. Um, and you can kind of like have a lot more financial upside as well then there is no other choice rather than Web3 kind of like products and, and projects. I just, I don't believe that there's anything out there that is as exciting as crypto right now. Um, but so, I mean, I'm talking like tech. Like if you count space as tech, then yeah. I mean, I would say that's the space field is just as exciting if you're involved in that. Like, you know, come on, it's space, right? Um, and then maybe some other things around, uh, I guess, like medical advances, like uh, longevity research, research and stuff like that. But that's stuff that I'm interested in as well, but I just don't have the time to dedicate to it. Ethereum is a full-time job, uh, more than a full-time job for me just to keep up with what's happening. Um, but, you know, I think that if you really want to make a difference, just doing the, that in the Web2 world is just not going to work anymore, I don't believe. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. A bit more info in the newsletter today if you wanted to check that out. Uh, so Connect put out some stats. The first week of their NXTP uh, pro, uh, product being live, which is a kind of like a, a cross-chain, cross-L2 bridging product. They've done $16 million of volume bridged uh, across chains in just seven days, which is really cool. And this happened only using $1.6 million of liquidity, which means they have a 10 to 1 volume to liquidity ratio at 0.05% fees. That's 30% stablecoin APY risk-free for a liquidity provider. So stablecoin APY being uh, uh, meaning that you don't have impermanent loss. So 
essentially risk-free besides, of course, smart contract and maybe some mechanism risks in there. Always got to put that little disclaimer there. But I mean, this is without token incentives too. And Connect isn't the only one doing this this growth. I mean, you've seen Hot Protocol and in, in Synapse, but Synapse has token incentives. But I mean, it's always great to see projects kind of, I guess, finding product market fit without token incentives because when you have token incentives or liquidity mining programs on a on a product, you may fall into a false sense of security where people are kind of like using your product and you see your TVL kind of like volumes going up and you think to yourself, wow, a lot of people love my product. They want to use my product. But in reality, they're just using it to get the rewards. They're going to dump the rewards and move on. And we've seen this countless times. And I've, I've talked about this before, but I mean, that's why I always love seeing projects that don't have a token or don't have any liquidity mining programs, um, you know, having uh, having this going on because it shows that they actually have product market fit. And I mean, for, to me, bridging and all the bridging kind of like protocols have, have, pr have product market fit immediately today because of the fact that all these other chains and L2s are spinning up and we need ways to easily bridge between them. So no brainer to me that that the Connects is seeing this growth. And just, I mean, as a disclaimer, I'm an investor in Connects, but I mean, come on guys, I'm investing in these things because I believe in them. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, um, uh, so yeah, just, just a disclaimer there. Um, and it really, actually, this is, this is really cool. I saw this today. This was probably the second coolest thing I saw today. Uh, I think Yuga Kole. Hopefully, hopefully, I said your name right there, mate. Uh, but essentially, uh, Yuga from Coinbase uh, published a blog post today uh, about EIP one five five nine and going over the technical benefits of EIP one five five nine in the context of Coinbase. And the TLDR is that Coinbase has burned two hundred and fifty ETH per day over fifteen thousand ETH to date, which is a you know decent chunk. Uh, we've burned what four hundred and fifty something thousand ETH at this point, four hundred and fifty two almost thousand ETH at this point. Um, so fifteen thousand ETH to date from just Coinbase, right? Just a, just one exchange is, is pretty cool. Um, they've also saved nine percent on gas fees using one five five nine rather than legacy transactions, and they did not sacrifice confirmation time despite these savings. Now, you, for those of you who remember, the one five five nine never had the goal of reducing gas fees. It had the goal of smoothing them out and making them more predictable, but definitely didn't have the goal of reducing them. And we've all seen that the gas fees have actually um, gone up since one five five nine went live. But because NFT mania started then, and NFT mania kind of like, and and the bull market kind of came back a bit during August and September of course, where the prices went up and things like that. So it wasn't 1559 that made things more expensive. But the fact that Coinbase is saying that they've saved on gas fees is just amazing. Because I've seen lots of people fudding 1559 saying, oh, it's uh, it's bad, it works for UX, it, it's kind of increased gas fees, all this kind of crap out there. And people just are really uneducated when it comes to this stuff. And it kind of irked me a lot because I did a lot of writing about 1559. I did a lot of research, a lot of tweeting about it. I covered it all, you know, a lot on the refuel, on the internet, the podcast for years. I talked about it to death and there was still so many people that didn't get it. And I, I don't know, like I just, how much can I do to get people to understand that uh, uh, 1559 is a massive benefit for Ethereum, not just because of the fee burn, but also because of the mechanism change as well. So really awesome to see this blog post from Coinbase. You can check this out. I'll be linked in the YouTube description. Um, I don't think it's too long of a read. It's only a four minute read, but as I said, the TLDR is here in the tweet. So Hugh Carp from Nexus Mutual put out a tweet, uh, I guess quote tweeting Nexus Mutual, where he said, you know, what's happening here? A fully on-chain risk-sharing DAO, like an insurer, allocating $50 million of its float to earn ETH2 staking yields. All yield accrues directly to the DAO, which is owned by members. In short, this is the future of insurance. So essentially what Nexus Mutual's DAO has done here is that they've put $50 million worth of ETH into Lido or into kind of, I guess, like ST ETH to stake it and to earn that, uh, that kind of like APR you get from staking there. This is really cool. I mean, DAOs are going to be so massive. People just still don't realize how massive DAOs are going to be because they're, they're kind of like uh, liquidity uh, nexuses where you, not not just because it's nexus mutual, but like an, an actual nexus where liquidity can kind of, or I guess like capital can kind of come into it and you can have billions and billions of dollars in there and that can be put to work doing anything. It, it's not limited by anything. It can, it can get the benefits of, all the kind of, I guess, composability, on-chain stuff that we all, we all get to kind of like uh, get benefits from within the Ethereum ecosystem, but at a DAO level with much more capital. So this is $50 million going into ETH2 staking directly from the Nexus DAO. It's just, I mean, as Hugh says, this is the future of insurance. This is the future of everything, really, at the end of the day. So um, I have another tweet that I'm going to talk about in a sec with regards to DAOs, but I thought this was, this was really cool here. 
All right, so this very long forum post from Rune Christensen here has a lot of people talking lately, but essentially this forum post is titled The Case for Clean, uh, the case for clean Money. And Rune uh, put it out on Twitter by saying, Maker is in, a, in the position to use the most powerful tool ever invented, money, to deal with the existential threat of climate change. It, climate change. Clean money grows and generates value through positive environmental impact. Now, I am definitely not going to read or give a TLDR on this post. I read it today. It is long. It is dense. It is probably something that extends far beyond crypto and maker and whatever. It talks about just climate change, I guess, more broadly, what we can do as a crypto ecosystem to kind of help with this, how we can use incentives, how we can use maker, all that good stuff. So I just wanted to bring it up because I highly suggest you all go give it a read. It is, I mean, as I said, it's dense, but it is an amazing post. I mean, obviously Rune has spent a lot of time thinking about this. And for those who don't know, Rune is the founder of MakerDAO, um, but he spent obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this, a lot of time thinking about where Maker fits into this. And there's actually other projects out there right now tackling uh, climate change as well. There's one called KlimaDAO, K-L-I-M-A DAO, which I'm monitoring closely. I think they're going live on, um, on Polygon soon. But uh, I think we can use kind of like crypto economics to not just what I was talking about before about public funding, uh, funding public goods, but also making real world impacts, whether it be kind of like, I guess, um, you know, helping people that are living in poverty or helping the climate change crisis. Or, I mean, we saw what Sandeep from Polygon did where he set up a fund to kind of get ventilators and beds for people uh, in India um, that were suffering from COVID and stuff like that. So, we can use this technology for much more good than what we're using it for today. And I think Rune's post here is like a rallying call for the ecosystem to, to kind of rally around this. So definitely go give it a read. Um, and, you know, I, I just think it's like required reading at this point for anyone who's interested in this sort of stuff. All right, so this tweet from Aaron Wright here where he basically has an image and he has like overlapping kind of like circles where NFTs, DeFi, and DAOs kind of overlap and, and DAOs being the biggest circle that encompasses NF, uh, NFTs and DeFi and NFTs and DeFi overlapping because that's just what they do. Now, DAOs, as I was talking about before, are going to be absolutely massive. People are really underestimating how massive they're going to be. DAOs, uh, not only are there, can be their own thing where you kind of create a DAO and you say, okay, we're, we're our own thing, but they also are created to manage things like DeFi and manage things like NFT projects. I mean, there's, there's DAOs out there today that buy NFTs, right? And kind of like collect them and have uh, a lot of different things going on. I mean, Aaron's part of one called uh, called Flamingo DAO, and he's also part of the Lao, which is like an investment, uh, a for profit investment DAO as well. Uh, but then you know, David Ho David Hoffman goes on to say Bitcoin and Ethereum also fit inside of the DAO circle, which they do because. Bitcoin and Ethereum are just DAOs, right? They're actually true DAOs. I think they're the only true DAOs where they're a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. A lot of DAOs today just look like DOs or DOs, decentralized organizations. They don't look, and you know, a lot of them don't even look like decentralized organizations. They look like COs, centralized organizations. But a true DAO, I think the only two true DAOs right now are Bitcoin and Ethereum because they're truly decentralized. They're truly autonomous because they work autonomously based on the crypto economic rewards baked in, based on the game theory baked in. Um, and they are an organization, right? Because they, they, uh, uh, they, they, it's just like massive worldwide kind of like organization. Not in the centralized sense, of course, in the decentralized sense. So I don't know. I just thought this image was something cool to bring up and, and to kind of like see this visualized is, is always great. I mean, I love visualizations like this. I think the fastest way to disseminate information in in any field is to kind of create like a simple to understand image out of it because it just easily, uh, because people are, uh, are kind of like visual um, thinkers, right? Like most people are visual thinkers and this kind of stuff clicks for them much faster than just reading like a paragraph about it. Uh, so, so yeah, I just thought it was cool and I wanted to bring it up. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.